Okay, folks, we are live. This is OLS3, uh, the P P Perseverance Cohort GitHub call. So, um, as a quick reminder, our uh, we have a code of conduct. So, as a general rule, please treat each other with respect that you'd like to receive. Um, and you can click and view the details of the code of conduct. It is on, I think, the second or third page. Um, I wonder if we have time to quickly add page numbers. Be really handy. Thank you, Malvika. Um, and if at any point you feel like you have uh, witnessed or experienced mm -hmm. something not in line with the code of conduct, then you can report that to the organizing team. Uh, that's team at openlifesci.org via email. Um, or if you need to report it to just an individual instead because you don't want to contact the whole team, we have all of our email addresses on the document. Um, is there anyone here who hasn't had the chance to introduce themselves at one of the last couple of calls? Okay, I will assume that we are mostly introduced, which is fantastic. Uh, hey, Christine. Uh, Hi. Sorry, I, I, in the meeting, there was a Google Meet link, so I was waiting. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, we will make sure we update those and remove the rest of them. Um, it is very annoying. I wish Google didn't do that by automatically. <laughs> uh, so we're just... Um, we're just kicking off. Uh, we've just gone through the code of conduct reminders. And um, I think, Malvika, are you ready to kick off the actual learning bits? Let's do it. Going to add link in the chat, uh, but this is also linked into the document. So this is the material that I'll be uh, using today. and. Uh, you don't have to open it, but if at all you want to go back after this workshop, you know that these materials are all online. So before we start, I'm just going to orient you where we are. So this is the document that I shared with you. This document runs along with the presentation as a slide, which is what we'll be using today. Again, you don't need to look at this right now, um, but these are all open for you to reuse. OK, so I'm going to present mode and i'll have to switch a little bit between my slides and the browser meanwhile just a quick reminder if you haven't had a chance to create a github repository uh, not github repository a github account please do so uh, while i go through the first bits of introduction so first of all uh, this might be a very easy question for you in the week five of OLS. What is collaborative documents and what are the main challenges in developing them? Um, I'm going to actually stop sharing and get a little bit of feeling of if you all understand that the collaborative documents have their own challenges. So give me some of the challenges that you think are the biggest ones. And you're, um, if you want to talk, please um, you know, unmute and say, and if you feel more comfortable, you can also just add hand word in the chat. So I'm gonna do that. If you write that, I'll call you. Well, as you know about me, how to actually use them. I mean, it's all a completely new word for me. And I like, what is GitHub? What is GitLab? What is the Google Collab Notebook? And how do I use them? And what do I need to know? And what do I not need to know? Yeah, but Fabian, can you, while you're on, can you tell me so far, whatever ways you've collaborated with people, let's say a Google Doc, what are the primary challenges you might have experienced? Oh, I'm in the stone age compared to all of you guys. I'm happy that I can use Slack and a Google Drive and a OneDrive and a, a note like um, um, share links and things like that. But yeah, like what what you were doing with with the with the GitHub and and uh, repositories that is that is all completely new to me. Uh, my mind is still blown. <laughs> okay, hopefully by the end of this workshop we get there. Get get to some place in GitHub. Um, so yeah, my answer is sometimes people are not contributing could be a challenge. Uh, can I think about conflicts? As in you have made a change and someone came along and made a change on the same line. So the conflict of what you were talking about. Also holding the history, what had happened when the project started, 
and where we are three months down the line, what happened in between, who made what kind of contribution. So these are some collaboration related challenges as well, right? Keeping the history is something definitely I wanna um, stress upon. I hope you resonate with some of these challenges and of course, keep adding in the chat if you feel there are a lot of them that we are not discussing at all. So when we work with many people collaboratively, there are some challenge like asynchronous conflict editing location. And when people are you know, in one time zone where they're sleeping while someone else is working and they never get a chance to come into an agreement, time zones and specifically versions, having this history. So let's think about a repository in, in the context of GitHub, but also parallelly, let's think about a Google Drive folder that you may have, which we are also gonna just call repository at the moment. You create this repository, you add file, you edit it, and you save it locally on your computer. Then what happens is that you can, over the period when your project grows, you start adding uh, folders, you start editing your existing uh, files, you start deleting some of the things that don't exist anymore. So as you would see, these plus signify that you're adding something, yellow is that you're editing it, and minus is if you're deleting something. And you still have it in your folder locally. Nobody minds and nobody has any problem with what you're doing. But then what happens over the period that these kind of editing, editing out, editing in, adding files, they start increasing. And there are some, there is some certain thing which is called revisions and versions. So you revise your document, but at every time point you do any sort of revision, you create a version of your document. So what is version control? What, version control is a management of changes called revision to any type of information. So for example, if we go back here, you might have a version zero where you actually started a file. You'll have a version, let's say what 1.0, which is the first version that you want to keep for your record. And then you start adding version two, version three, version four and version five and so on. As you start saving your file in, in different names, that's bad practice, so take it as a, as a different name. What happens that you start to accumulate Oops. You start to accumulate different number of files that are not important. However, you also want to make sure that you're not losing information. So version control is actually a way for you to store the same file while ensuring that you're keeping a track of these history, these records of who made what change at what time uh, in your project development. So some of the things that you already use are these Google Drive, uh, Dropbox, there could be um, some other simple tools that you are already using. And the advanced tools are Git and Subversion. So Git is an open source free version tool that you use to make version control in your file locally. It is a bit different from the version control that you have, for example, in um, Google Drive. So what happens in Google Drive, if I can just click here, it's a Google file, right? It's a Google slide. Here it says last edit was made 26 minutes ago. And if, you, if I open this, it will show me all these different time points where different people might have made change. So at the moment, I'm the only author. So you will see that on 1st October 2020, I did a change. And then on 10th March at 9.58 this morning, I made some change. Um, and these are also recorded. So at any point of time, if I want to go back to another version which was created in the past, I'll be able to do that without uh, compromising the changes that I have currently at the moment. Okay, so I'm going to go back here. To just iterate on the benefits that you can go back on previous version, you can store the history and collaborate with others without having to duplicate your files over and over. So I have one file that I've been maintaining since 2018. So now what I want to do that this file that I was creating locally, I want to add this into a repo online repository uh, where people can access it. And now let's assume that there are three other collaborators that you have. And these collaborators are somewhere else. Something that you created in your computer locally, you put online so they can make the changes that they want 
in order to contribute to your project. And they all can work locally as well if, you, if they want to create a version of that. So this is a distributed collaboration that you're doing. And we will be facilitating that through GitHub. So GitHub is an online, uh, it, it, it hosts our repository online. It helps other people to work with us and collaborate with us. And it provides a web interface for version control. It can be used for a different sort of communication, which, is, which makes it quite social and interactive. And you can also use it for any sort of projects. So for example, if you're coding, you can store code up there, but if you're really just creating documentation that can also be hosted up there. But at the same time, it also allows combination of all that. So with the very quick introduction to GitHub, I would ask you to log into your uh, Git account. So I'm just going to make sure that you all have so you have github.com where you will have your own profile. Your, your front page would look different than mine, but in principle, you would have your profile here. You will see a plus symbol. So with that, I'll stop for a second to judge and assess if everybody has a profile. Can you all use the reaction with right uh, to say if you have uh, your account? So if you click on reaction, yeah, a symbol emoji would also work. For example, you can also say yes. Good, all of you have it. Okay. I'm gonna put mine down. Um, so what we, we will do now is create our first repository. And the first repository, you can name whatever you want, but let's say we will use a word, uh, we will use this friendly collab party as our default name, but you can change that if you want. So let's go out on our page. We click on the plus sign on the top right. I hope you can see it. Let me know if I need to increase the font as well. So I click on the new repository. When I create a new repository, it asks me all these information. So for the moment, I'm going to ignore every information. All I want is to add a name for my repository. So I'm going to call it friendly collab party. You can continue using the same name, uh, or you can also create a repository for your own uh, project with a name that you prefer. So. We gave a repository name and we're gonna click on this one, which just says add a readme file. And I will click create repository. Quickly, what we did is we went on the front page, we clicked on the plus symbol, we create a new repository, we give a file, project name and we choose add a readme file. Please keep your project open, which is public. Uh, we will delete it if we don't need it, but um, as an open source, open science training, I would recommend you to keep it public at the moment. And now we create a new repository. It's a bit hard for me to see everybody, so uh, do interrupt me if things are a bit faster and if you would like to you know, slow me down and uh, show you things again. Now again, I'm gonna assist by asking, do you all see this? So instead of Malvika Sharan, you should have the profile name that you have created, followed by the project name that you have selected. Yeah, I see a couple of yeses. How about I ask if someone couldn't do it and would like us to help them do it? You can unmute yourself and ask us to show it again. Okay, I don't see any question and I'm assuming that this is all working all right so far. Okay, so what happens is when you create a, a repository, it is visible to anybody the moment that you start sharing it. I mean, in principle, they can find out if you have created something or not, but generally people are not constantly looking for the new project that has been opened. So one of the things that we say that when people have this feeling that, oh, I don't wanna make it public, what if people say my project repository doesn't look good? The point is they're not looking at it. So there is no point hiding it even. So 
if you have your own project, you would like to have it open. The reason you want to have it open, you would like to invite other people to work with it. Because we had our previous cohort call uh, discussion on readme files, so we know what readme files are, right? So we have one repository right now with one file, which is readme, which only says the name of my repository. What I want to do now is to actually edit this file. Conveniently, there is a, a symbol, which is a pencil symbol. So I can click on the pencil symbol and I can see that there is the, that I can change this. So I don't want these spaces. I want to remove those spaces so I can just edit. And I can also add a little bit of information which says this is my test repository. Right, but if you are actually creating your own project, you already have a vision statement, which you may be able to add here, um, or you can edit and, and add as many information as you want. But at the moment, let's stick with one single line so we can test what else we can do. So when we have edited this, we can scroll down. It asks us to commit changes. Commit in GitHub basically means save changes. So it's like, you know, control and S that you uh, do in your Google document. What it is also allowing us to do is to describe to anybody what these changes are. So here I'm just going to write adding a sentence about read me oh, about sorry about project about my project. You can also optionally add a lot of description, but at the moment I don't need that because it's only one single line. So I'm going to directly commit on the main branch and when say main branch, it's your repository directly. So I'll commit changes here. So you see that there is your file and you have one single line. And if you wanna go back to your landing page, which is your project folder, you can come back and see you still have one page with readme, but your readme file looks a bit different. I'm gonna stop here for a second and I think I have a background noise, but we, we should also take this time to just unmute ourselves and ask questions uh, about the readme file and the repository so far. What happens if you don't, if you unclick the README file? I've done that the other day and it looked odd. <laughs> but but I, I don't know, you know, what, what, if that was supposed to look that odd. <laughs> well, what do you mean by unclicking the file? So when we set up, when we uh, clicked on the plots and added the new repository, um, then you told us to uh, check the box saying README file. So what happens if, if you don't? Right, so what happens is when you don't click anything, it will ask, it will show you a set of instruction which will ask you to initiate your repository. So if you don't have anything in your repository, GitHub finds it very hard to publish it because it's like, I don't really know what you want me to tell the world about your repository. So this is why we always initiate with readme. So at least you have one file in your repository. Yeah. Right. So uh, there is an, a lot of like nuances that comes with the using local version of Git, but because we're not using Git today, it's a bit hard to explain that part. Um, but let's say you created a repository and you did not add a readme file or any other file, you can always come back to your repository and add a file before you initialize. So initializing means adding at least something in your repository. So it is, a, it is available on the internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so what we're gonna do right now, I'm gonna share my screen and go back to my slides to make sure that I'm following along. So we have our first repository, first of all, congratulations. And we also have a readme file which says a minimum information about my repository. So what you saw in the readme file is that we had if I'm just gonna click on this one, there is a hash symbol in front of my word, which is my header. 
followed by something which has nothing in front of it. So, and also there's another thing to notice is that my file is ending with .md. So if you know a text file, generally a text file ends with .txt, right? A document will end with .doc. The .md here signifies markdown. Markdown is a simple language that we use to format our files. So for example, if you have a HackMD page that we had sent for your mentor mentee meeting, it is a hack markdown because it also uses markdown for um, writing beautiful looking uh, files. So if I click on preview without actually going to any change, you will see that one single hash actually gives you a top header level. So I'm going to demo something about Markdown and after that we'll go and take a short breakout. So I'm gonna write Markdown. So I'll just keep it like that uh, because I want to make sure that I'm covering it properly. So Markdown has something uh, with it. So it has multiple features. I'm going to start by one hash, which we already saw and it's a header one level. But if you add two hash symbol, it is actually header two. So if I click on my preview change, you will see that there is a size decrease. So you have a first level header, you have second level header, and you can go on until actually four level where it, it stops to make sense. So you can have header level three and four, you know, you can keep on adding that. If you add anything under your header level without actually a hash symbol, so you can see that this actually treats it as a common text that text appears under your header. So this is quite smart in the sense that it understands what you want your text to look like. So within your content, you might want to add a list of information. So let's create list. Um, and the list can start by an asterisk followed by item name. So let's say item one, and I can press enter and it automatically gives me an asterisk. So I can add at item two and so on. So if I click now preview change, it shows me that I have actually a bulleted item number one, two, and three, and so on. What if I want numbered list? Because right now we have bulleted list, which is unnumbered list. So bulleted numbered list can be written as one point item one. And when I press enter, it actually smartly uh, understands that it's a bulleted number. So it, you can go on adding your items and so on. So now if I preview change, you can see that these are differentiated as uh, this one was bulleted and this is a numbered list. I'll show finally two things more before I let you go and uh, test this in your own readme file. If I want to write italics, if I want to write, let's say I write my name in italics because I, I, I am special and I want people to notice it. So I would be using an asterisk in the front and in the end of the word that I want to italicize. So if I go and preview the change, you'll see that my name is italicized. Similarly for bold letters, I can use bold. So you can see that it actually does the visualization here already that you can see this is italicized, this is bold, but when it uh, renders, meaning that when it shows me how it should look like in the file, it will only be bold. If you want both italics and bold, you would use three asterisk. in the front and the end. And now when I come back here, it shows italics, bold, and both italics and bold. One thing that you notice that even though I wrote these things in separate line, the markdown doesn't really recognize them as a separate line because it requires a space. So if you want to really create separate lines, you'll have to give a space between uh, the sentences to let markdown know that these are separate lines. So with that, I'm actually going to stop and I'll show you in your uh, shared document, there's a cheat sheet. 
and we will send you in different breakout rooms to test these markdown features. But before we do that, do we have some questions regarding what we've seen so far? Before questions, can I just break in and quickly ask people to add W or S for written or spoken breakout rooms uh, while we're doing the questions or um, add W and S to your Zoom names if you don't mind either. I'm reading now all the comments about tech savviness and not tech savviness. I think the markdown is a very good, uh, it looks tech savvy, but it's quite simple that way that we can all have a bit more um, beautiful looking documents without having to worry about how to do it. Let me find the markdown cheat sheet. So here's the markdown cheat sheet. Once you have assigned yourself to um, one of the preferred breakout rooms, one of us will be in each breakout room to help you navigate if you get lost a little bit. Hey, can I ask a question? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was wondering why uh, open source projects use Sphinx uh, for their uh, documentation websites and their websites in general. Yeah, I think this comes from uh, before Markdown age that uh, Sphinx was one of the easiest way to host document. Um, so a lot of people still do that because there are a lot of uh, servers that allows you to host documentation using Sphinx. But uh, honestly, in the last few years, we have moved a lot from Sphinx to just continue using Markdown. Um, so it's a, it's a really a, a selection of choice, like you know, what is most convenient for you and your community. Yeah, I did face that sometimes when I worked with Frank to complete open source projects. I, I was surprised when first time I, uh, I saw Sphinx. It's actually very complicated. But yeah. First time you see it. So I think there is this is an open source thing, right? Like we we want to work with open source software, and Sphinx is one of the open source software that's available. But now we are also moving towards using open source software that's easy to use. So this is why we try to teach Markdown. Okay, so are we ready to go? We will take 10 minutes to just work on some of our README file. If you already have your own project probably use your own project's vision statement or other documents that you've created in past four weeks. If not, just stick with this example that I've shared in the chat, which is my test repository. Okay, folks. Um, I have spoken room one, Christine Fabian Nihan, written room Masako Kala Anshika, and then written or spoken, it's up to you, Aida, Abdul, Abdul uh, Kali, and Maya. And I'm sending you in 10 minutes now. Uh, yes, uh, well, I think, I'm not sure. <laughs> give it a try. If you want to share your screen, give it a try. If you, uh, if yeah. you stumble, I'll tell you. OK, let me just share screen. Sorry. Why doesn't it say which one is this? It doesn't tell me which. Um, sorry. Okay, don't, somehow, don't worry. So, now, somehow it's not telling me which Google, because I have, I've got like a hundred tabs open and it's not telling me which it's not showing me me which one of the tab i want to you can just share. select the first one which says all so when you open the current screen it will allow you to share that one okay i'm totally not sure what i'm gonna share with you guys <laughs> uh uh 
Also, do you know what I can I can be your is it sharing? I can something? be your hand. Okay, yay. <laughs> I, no, that's yours. That's mine, yeah. No, oh, sorry. Okay, yeah. Um it's opening up like security and privacy settings. Okay, Carla, let's let's do that next sorry. time. Don't worry. No, no, <laughs> yes. It's, it's totally fine. Let's move on for the sake sorry of time. But what I actually wanted uh Car Carla would have done it really well if we would have shared the screen. So what we did is obviously, you know, try these markdown, but we also added an image. So there are two ways to add image, uh, which which is something you might want to do, right? That you, you might want to share with people different images or infographic that you create. So first of all, if you want to add link, you, you might have done this where you add text for the link that you want to share and the link path here, right? For example, let's say I want to give you, I want to say click my readme, but I want to allow you to click on this file. So I'm going to just directly take that file and add the link here. So you would be able to see that there is a click my readme. So if I click it, it will actually just land to the same page where I'm working. So what if I want to add an image? So if you want to add an image, you would actually use, start with an exclamation mark and the square bracket, followed by the link of the file. And for example, I'm going to add name. So here I'm going to say baby cat because we were trying to add a baby cat. Copy each location. And then I can add it here. And this will convert that into an image, which is a very cute baby cat. So I'm going to commit changes. <laughs> this file needs to be deleted from the internet at some point. But if you want to, this, this is something I'm not gonna do here, but if you want to add more files, which are images or GIF, for example, you can that, add that by adding file, but upload files. When you click upload, it opens this page and it allows you to choose any file that you have locally. Having said that, please always use the file that someone has allowed to reuse. So just don't go randomly picking images from the internet, but look at the CC by or somewhat similar license. Again, I'm really glad the last time we had in our cohort call the talk discussion around uh, our image usage. So I think this is this is quite basic instruction to what we are doing, that we are trying to collaborate by sharing files and the files that we are doing are in the markdown format. I think we took a lot longer than I had expected. So I'm gonna just give it to you um, if we can move on from there. Awesome, I'm gonna now do my screen share and uh, share. Okay, hopefully you can see my slides. Are they big enough and readable? All right, let me get on the right page as well. And 34. Okay, so um, what we've already learned now, very quickly, it, it, this is enough to actually get you started with making your own website. Um, so I'm going to try and keep this really flying because we have about nine more minutes left on the main call, but I, I think some of us can hang around maybe for a little bit afterwards if there's more questions or you want to try it out um, while we're around. Um, so what we've learned just before gave us the tools to make links and to format pages a little bit. Um, but what's really nice is that GitHub, GitHub can automatically host these as web pages on the internet, so you can have your own website with most of what you've learned already. Um, and so we're going to focus just on using the GitHub GitHub IO domain, but if you um, are really keen on this and you want to make your own, then it is also possible to, let's say, buy, um, buy a domain name and then have, for example, openlifesci.org, which is hosted on GitHub in the way that we're describing. Uh, so what I'm going to ask everyone to do now is to try and follow along with um, enabling making a website yourself. 
So this is, um, if you see here, is an example where you go to settings on the top right, but actually I'm just going to switch tabs to my very own friendly collab party where I've been following along with Malvika's work. Um, and just show the same thing as well. I'm going to make this bigger again. So um, if on your own repository, go to settings. This is on the top right of all of these little tabs. I click on settings and then I scroll a long way down and you just keep scrolling and keep scrolling and I wish it was easier to find but when you see github pages you found what you want to actually enable um, hosting your own web page so for me it says github pages is currently disabled that's fine that's because I haven't turned it on yet but what I'm going to do I'm going to click on none and I'm going to say use the main branch um, and that will actually mean that the files in my main branch will now go on the on the internet as a web page. Um, so I'm going to leave this the same where it says root. I'm not going to change anything and I'm just going to press save. Um, and now that should be enough that I actually have a, my very own web page. Now it takes usually a few seconds to actually update. But if I scroll right back down to GitHub pages, um, then you can see here it has given me a URL. Um, so I can open this and I can view it. And here you can see I in fact have my very own web page, uh, which I have made using GitHub pages. And so I can update this with the markdown, with the links and with the images and so on. Um, and what's the words I'm looking for here? I can make more pages as well. So I could, for example, add, um, you know, an about me page or there are many other things about that. Um, shall I cover any more of the web page stuff or shall I hop on to pull requests? I think you can quickly show a team one. Good idea. Yeah. Okay. So the other thing that's really nice is you may have noticed how uh, it, it's somewhat mundane. We've got blue and we've got black and that's great, but sometimes we want more colors as well. Uh, so back here on our GitHub pages area, you can see the theme chooser. Uh, so grab a theme. Um, I'll just go back. I clicked on that really fast. You click on choose a theme. And it gives you a bunch of built-in themes that you can use on your own. Um, more advanced usage is also possible to customize these, but I wouldn't worry about that too much at the minute. And I really quite like this bright yellow one here, Leap Day. So I'm just going to click on Leap Day and it gives me a bit of a preview so I can browse around all of the others if I want to get an idea of what they look like. But I'm going to choose Leap Day. It's just too sunny. Uh, and then I go to the green select theme. So I press that. That should be enough that it will update. And now I have it loaded. So this may or may not refresh to that theme already. Yeah, it's going to take a minute or two, but if I come back and refresh in like, you know, two minutes or five minutes, it will show the theme and it will be really fancy and pretty. Um, but actually, it takes a little while for it to the sausage machine to spit out the actual end product. Um, it's just thinking at the minute, but trust me, it is there. Um, so those are a nice things so that within two or three clicks, you can actually set up a theme for your own personal website for your project if you wish to do so. Um, I, given that we have four minutes left, I'm going to talk a little bit about collaborating. Um, so there's two ways that you can collaborate. The first one is uh, quite good. I'm here on settings. Um, is there any chat that I need to? So can you just quickly scroll and show in the setting where the GitHub page section is? Yeah, sure. Okay, so once you click on settings, um, this is just like literally just scroll down for ages and ages. It is annoyingly far down for like one of my most used features. Um, but it's after archives and it's just on the main page. Um, but I'll get her pages or I suppose another way might be if I do command F or control F and then just type page, then it automatically brings it up, which is slightly faster. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about the two ways that one can collaborate on a um, GitHub repository. So one is over here, still in settings. So main settings, there is manage access on the left. Um, and if I click on manage access, oh, it's going to ask me for my password again. 
just because it wants to make sure that I haven't left my screen open and some hacker hasn't just wandered over to my computer, which is nice. So, so I'm a very mischievous collaborator. Um, but here I can click on invite a collaborator. And so I want Malvika to be able to actually um, edit my repositories. So I'm going to invite Malvika and I'm going to invite Berenice. <laughs> I, was gonna, I was thinking I could add two at once, but I don't think I can. And then I can also search for, actually, are you Beba? I'm my brain. There we go. And I've invited her. So both of you would now get emails, um, which would allow you to actually edit this, because before this, no one could edit it. Only I had the permissions to do this. But this has given them direct permissions to actually modify the, um, the website directly. Uh, to modify the, the, the repository directly is probably a better way of putting that. And so I can see that now there's two invitations. I assume no one's actually accepted it, but if they accept it, then they can go and edit. Um, and so if they wanted to edit it, they could just do the same. They could go to this URL to my repository um, and just start editing stuff. And that's fine if we, um, but then we've talked that one of the challenges that you sometimes have is that there may be clashes, like when people edit the same thing and then you need to merge the versions and things like that. So there's another way, uh, another type of terminology that we use called a pull request, where basically rather than just editing things directly, you say, hey, here's the change I've made. Um, and you politely ask, can you merge it in when you're ready? Um, and so right now you can see that I have Wow, Malvika, you are amazing. That, you're flying. Um, I have a pull request from Malvika. So she has made a change that she would like to add. Um, and she's done it the polite way by doing a pull request and then me choosing whether or not it's appropriate to actually merge in. It just makes it easier to track what's going on when you do this pull request rather than just editing it. Um, so I can go and I can look at it and I can say, what's happened here? Um, and I look and it says here files changed. So I can get an idea of what files have changed. Um, and so it just shows here um, with the pluses and the green, it says, hey, I am here. So I know that's exactly what she's changed. I know that there's you know, nothing, nothing's gonna go wrong if I add this to the website. So I'm just gonna say, awesome. I could review it if I wanted and I could approve. That's not a necessary step. Uh, instead, mm -hmm. I'm gonna go back to conversation and scroll to the bottom. And I'm just gonna say, this is perfect. This is what I wanted on my um, repository anyway, and I'm going to merge it. And I bet if I go and refresh now, it'll have the theme, but it won't have Malvika's content yet. It doesn't have Malvika's content now, but you can see that we have updated with a theme that I added earlier on. But that's only half. So now I have merged a pull request, but I haven't actually created one of my own. Um, and so you can, you can create pull requests on your own repository, or you can create on um, just about anyone else's repository as well. So for example, if you noticed a typo on the Open Life Science website, then you could make a pull request to us. Uh, so I'm going to really quickly run through this and I'm sorry that we're running a little bit late and also um, I just want to make sure that we can see it before as people have to hop off. Um, but I'm going to do the same thing as before. I'm going to edit this readme and this time I'm going to put actually right at the end example pull request here. Um, so again I've just added one line and in fact I'm going to show what it's like to modify a line as well. So that's two, two, two small edits I've made, and I'm going to say demoing pull requests. Um, and if you see here, um, I can commit directly, uh, but I'm actually going to make a new branch and start a pull request. Uh, so this is, again, this is rather than just editing things directly, it's actually sort of just requesting that these changes be added um, and then we can add them at our leisure and review them or maybe go back and say, hey, can you change this, please? Because this wasn't what we were thinking or it's broken. Um, so I'm going to select that second radio and I'm going to give it a descriptive name. I'm going to say pull request demo because descriptive names are always easier when you go back and you have to review things later on. And I'm going to click propose changes. Um, so it's not quite done. It's just, I can add more of a description here. So if this was um, like, I'd edited a bunch of sections and there was more changes that I've made, I might write a longer description. It's optional. It depends on whether or not it's useful and meaningful. And I'm gonna ask Malvika to review this. And then I'm gonna click create pull request. And so this hasn't edited the readme file. It's just requested that we 
that we actually edit the README file and then uh, Malvika might review this and choose to merge it now. Um, so that was a flying intro, um, just so you have uh, the basic idea about what pull requests are, but I recognize that there might be more uh, questions. So I'm going to stop sharing and just ask any questions at this point. And thank you for bearing with us while we run slightly over time. So I guess we can keep the recording running, but uh, for folks who have to leave, please feel free to leave. Uh, we understand that it's one hour. Last time this workshop went for three hours, we won't be able to do that, but I'm here for half an hour to um, really play on some of the repository to do some of the pull requests. So Yo, would you like to demo, if you're here for another five minutes or so, to demo what people can do to test the pull request. I have added a link on the chat. Sounds good. I'm just taking, ah, right. Yes. Okay. Right. So I will reshare and I will demo how I'm going to test a pull request on Malvika's uh, repository just really quickly. So uh, share, share screen. And we want to share that one and share. Right, I'm reshared. So uh, now I'm looking at the link that Malvika shared in the chat, and I think that's hopefully big enough. Um, so this is the uh, same, same steps as I went through just a couple of minutes ago, but this time rather than doing it on my own repository, I'm doing it on Malvika's. And again, you can do exactly the same thing. So I'm looking at her repo. And I'm going to click on the pencil here to add in um, a pull request to edit the file. So I click on pencil. Um, it's, it's commented that we've created a fork. Um, so I'll just talk about that terminology really quickly. Um, so basically, right now, we can see that this is under Malvika's account, and this is under her repository. So it's going to create one under my account, a copy of this repository under my account. Don't worry too much about what that means. Just remember that when you make pull requests uh, on other people's repositories, you usually make a copy, make edits on your account, and then you push it to theirs um, to make the pull request. So I, as a reminder, I went, I clicked on the pencil, and then I'm just going to go and I am going to name one thing I loved about this session. Uh, I love watching people learn how to use GitHub. And I'll put my name in. Yo. And if you're feeling sneaky, you can even use emoji. So I'm going to put little rows in there as well. Um, but you can use markdown just like before. So this is the uh, numbers and I can preview change. And you can see that this is a list and it shows that I've deleted the empty line and replaced it with a line that has things that are populated in it. So if I go back to here, I'm going to say I think that's enough that um, oh, I forgot to add my forks link. So I'm going to do that as well. My forks link. Um, so this is just a quick reminder of how you do forks yourself. Ah, You'll have to come back and add it. You yeah. have to do this full request. Maybe remove that fork link. Yeah. Maybe it's not. yeah. So um, you have to do this in a second step because right now I don't have an access to my forks link. Um, so you might want to do two pull requests if you want to add the link as well. Sorry. Um, yeah. So I'm going to leave it at that for now. And I'm going to scroll down and say add Yo's PR contribution as the description of what I've done. I don't think it needs an extended description. And I'm going to click Propose Changes. And Malvika should see that as a pull request now. Um, but what I can also see, actually, is um, we talked about finding the URL for my own fork. Oh, no, I haven't. No. Sorry, I skipped one step. There's a last green button I hadn't pressed. Until I press Create, it hasn't actually been created. And again, I'm just going to leave the description blank and I'll press create. Here we go. OK, right. So this is now a pull request that exists. You can see that the number of pull requests here is one. So what we'd like is for everyone to go through and follow the same process and try and make a pull request um, on Movika's repository. 
But also I just want to do briefly mention before this is that now I have a fork of this under my own repositories as well. So if I click on my name and I click on my repository, so that's my name on the top right corner and my repositories, you can see that I have a fork of it. So now I could um, link to this or people could make a pull request to mine, but that's just complicated and let's not worry about that. But just so you know, that that's how you'd add the um, link to your own fork if you needed to do. Uh, so again, the task is just if you if you have time to stick around for a few minutes, um, go to Malvika's re repository, make a pull request just to add your own line and we'll, we'll uh, see how that goes. All clear? Stop share. Okay, feel free to ask questions if you have any questions, but I think we can just hang it, hang around um, and we'll be on mute while people are giving it a go. So let us know when you want us to try and merge your stuff or if you get stuck. Um, Yo, can you please repeat again uh, what is exactly the forks link to uh, add? Maya, skip that. We don't want for click right now. Just add one name and whatever. Make a change in any one of the lines, and that's it. So I have, I'm going to share my screen just to show that I have two pull requests from two different people. So I'm going to first go to Fabien. So it is, I'm going to follow what you were saying. I'll check what file number has changed. And I see here that uh, Fabian has added. So one thing that I would be able to do, which you don't have to worry about, but in the future, remember, it tells me that the branch has no conflict but it also tells me that there's a change that fabian made and i was like oh you know what i would actually like to keep this line but also want to keep fabian's line so i can myself go edit the file where i keep fabian's line but i also add gill's line so because i have like the full power in this <laughs> i get to do that so i will I will actually just create a new PR. Oh, wasn't a good idea. Oh, I will just directly commit it in Fabian's patch. So now it shows me this and I can go back, comment, thank you. What does the red and the green mean? Sorry. What what did the red and the green color mean? R red means deleted. Green means added. Uh, and there would be yellow. Sometimes I would say something has changed. So I'm going to show you uh, show others what we're talking about. So in the left side, it shows what file looked like before you made change. And on the right, it shows what it looks like now. So when you were making change, there was one line. Well, it was the line that uh, you had written. And on the right, it shows that you have write, written a new one. 
and generally when you create a, a new file where nobody has made change in the left side there would be empty and on the right side the file um, and i'll show you let me merge this one i'll well i don't need to approve i'm going to do that can you just quickly show the um, minus and the plus to show how it accommodates for colorblind users oh yeah of course so I'm going to go to the next pull request that I had from Nihan. So I have this one from Nihan. Um, and I'm going to show the file. So in the file changes, you would see that this says plus and minus, right? And plus and minus says add and remove. So on the left side, what you see are minus, and on the right side, it says plus. So if I, for example, so here you see the minus symbol on the left side and on the right side, it shows plus. Um, what I will do, because I know that this is a non-typical example, it would not hopefully happen, but I know that in my first and second line, I already have entry by two contributors. So I'm gonna move Nihan's contribution to next. I'll add Nihan's name. So as a reviewer, I can decide if there, there is going to be a conflict. And I'll just go and commit changes to Nihans. So now it, it is showing me here that there, there was something that's been moved down, which is plus. Does that make sense? So now I'm going to go back to the conversation. Is that true? <laughs> I actually find that quite funny and I'm gonna just give it a tiny emoji. And it actually shows me that there is a conflict. But again, this, this is like a rare case when you have a lot of people writing at the same time, this conflict can happen. When people are writing different times, this conflict would not happen. So I can click on that and I will. So don't worry about this conflict. Uh, you wouldn't have to take care of that. But in principle, in the GitHub, you can also edit before it is marked as result and then I connect. So as a contributor, you don't have to worry so much about conflict, but as a person who's reviewing your contribution, I need to make sure that my conflicts are removed before I merge anything. So I'm going to quickly go back to the files that you all are creating, which is here and what you will see that there are three lines, Yo, Fabian, Nihan, and you can actually see on the top that there are four contributors, including me. A great thing about this is that if you click on the history, the history actually shows at what point different changes were made. So it shows that Yo made a PR nine minutes ago, I accepted that, then Nihan and Fabian made PR, and then I merge them. And you can actually just move down the line to see um, what sort of history this file has. So this is wonderful because nobody can ever steal your contribution. Like I can never claim that I was the only one who contributed. So right now it seems like we're just adding file names, but think about intellectual input into a file that you're creating or a code that you're developing together this actually records your contribution quite openly and transparently. So you get acknowledged for the work you do without having to make multiple copy of these files. Okay, Maya, I think I have another PR, but I hope so far it is helpful. And please ask us any question because I know pull request takes a few more trial before we understand what is really happening. A little bit of theory is behind that we have a main branch that I had created. And what you did as an external contributor, you said, oh, I want to write in this, but you don't have access to my repository because I never added you as a contributor. So you take my repository, make a version of that in your own profile. You make change in your own profile and you let me know that, hey, this is a pull request because I want you to merge the changes that I have done. So in principle, this local repository that you have created for yourself is yours. Nothing happens. If you may change in this, nothing happens to the original. This is why I say you cannot break a lot in GitHub because it allows you to keep track of who's the contributor, where the problem came from, or where the great input came from. So all of these knowledge are stored up there. 
also like one thing I want to say that we are not promoting GitHub as GitHub, but I think GitHub is something that's used very commonly in open source. But if you prefer, you can also use some other uh, web hosted repository software. Great, Maya, did you fin figure out your pull request? I can see it now. Yeah, great, I see, see that too. This is why it takes a few trial. It isn't intuitive. It isn't most friendly version of working, but yeah, I think you just get used to this, this quirkiness of GitHub. Can I ask a quick question? So if we had someone as a collaborator, still uh, they need to use pull requests, maybe I missed, but, uh, or they can directly uh, um, change something in my repository. Yo, you wanna explain that? No, okay. I do. Um, so if you've given someone permission to edit your repository, they can go and do it straight. Um, and it maybe that's fine, um, but it tends to be really nice to use the pull request workflow uh, for a few reasons. So one is like um, a real real world scenario might be if I needed to change something on the RLS website, I would rather have Malvika or Berenice or someone else review uh, my pull request and make sure that I don't have any broken links or that I haven't written something that was completely wrong. Um, and so it's a way of like notifying people to say here, yeah, OLS, OLS website is built completely on GitHub pages. Uh, Berenice is our wizard of GitHub pages. <laughs> um, so when we make changes on the website, we always use a pull request just because it's a polite way of organizing and showing things um, that are going on. Um, but there's nothing stopping us from actually editing it directly. And like if we were in a rush, we might do that. Um, but then we're also aware that it's easier for us to accidentally break the website that way, for example. Uh, Carla, you have a question? Yeah, sorry. Um, so once I, I I make make or do a fork, make, fork, I don't know. Oh, <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> I can see the, uh, the repo in my repositories, okay? Uh, and I can contribute to, to it by pull by making pull requests and things like this. But for example, why right now I don't see any changes in the document that has been changed. So if I access the um, 2021-03-10 attendees MD document within, from within my repo, so from within the fork that I have in my, I don't see any changes. I still see the original one, so I, I don't, I can't see that something has changed. Is that normal? Is that it because is. you haven't added me? Okay. So um, basically what's going on here, this is correct. Um, but basically it goes, that GitHub is distributed. Uh, Git is distributed. That means there's no source of truth. Um, and so that means that unless you pull um, the changes on Movika's repository onto your repository, you'll never see the changes. So if you look at Movika's repository, you will see them. Um, but what you can do is you can do pull requests the other way around. So you could pull things from Movika's repository into yours if you wanted to see the changes. But because it's your repository and you have control, that won't happen until you say, I want this to happen. Um, okay. And that so, and that I do by by um, by actually so making a pull request from my repository. Okay, so new new pull request from within my fork. Yeah, do you, I, I can try and quickly pull stuff from Malvika's repository and sh screen share it. Okay, I'm gonna give it a go. Uh, sharing screen share. Okay, can you see my GitHub, uh, my Vika's GitHub? Yeah. Okay, uh, I um, haven't practiced this one, so it might take me a little <laughs> bit of trying to get this right. I think I want to do it the other way around. I think I want to go to my fork and do this. So, oh, let's see what happens if I click on compare across forks. Ah, okay, this is fine. So I'm on my Vika's repo and I clicked compare across forks. Um, so we take a look at the arrow here. 
Um, uh -huh. And so that helps me have an idea of what the direction is. So I want Movika stuff to go into my things. So that means that I want to change this one on the left to be my repository. So I'm going to click here. I'm going to choose my username. So now theoretically, it's pulling everything from Malvika's repository into my repository. And in fact, if I look here, it says there's 16 commits and one file has changed from six people. And if I think about what we've been doing, that makes perfect sense. So that seems like about the right number of people. And I look at all of the updates and here, and I can see Malvika's done some merging and various different people have made the pull requests. So I think, yep, that looks about right. And so I, I click on create pull request um, and I'm going to say merge all Malvika's changes back into my copy. Uh, and I'm going to click create pull request. And now I can see that that pull is there. And I can also do the same things as before, because now this is just like any other pull request where I can click on it and I can go and admire what's changed. But it's going to show me all of the changes at once um, because it, it's kind of squashed them together. So I don't have to look at each one one by one, but I can see all of the changes. And I think, OK, that's perfect. That's what I wanted to merge. I'm happy with that. So I'll go back to conversation, scroll down and I'm going to merge it and confirm the merge. Uh, and so now if I go right back to the code and the code tab, and I can see all of the updates in the 2021 file that were it's on perfect. Malvika's repository that weren't okay. there before. Okay, that's, that's great. So that it, this will be like a good thing to do before you start working on anything. Just, just do this comparing for and, and make sure that you are seeing the, la the latest version of the document. Okay, thanks. Totally. So can we, as we are up there, um, Yo, do you want to show the insight, insight part of the GitHub? Good plan, good plan. Okay. So. If you remember uh, last week, we talked about the files in the cohort calls that are really important. Um, and what's nice and sneaky is that this insights tab here on your repository or on any other repository has uh, some ways to easily make it make, make um, some of these files by default. So I've clicked on insights and I'm actually gonna go and I'm gonna click on, is it pulse? Oh, you might oh, be no, able to you, do that for yeah, your... Yeah, you need to demo it, Malvika, because um, she owns the, the first fork, mm -hmm. so... Yeah, so if you have your own repository, you can actually do that on your friendly. Let's let's do the friendly one because you all have that, so you, you can... So I'm going to my repository. I have the friendly collab party that we had created together. I'm going to the insight. And in inside, I see a community. And this is basically what you learned last time. In order to make your project community friendly, you will need some files. So it is very conveniently telling me that the, these are the things that you need to add in your repository to make it community friendly. Um, so I have README, but I don't have a license, which is really uh, not making anybody comfortable about using my thing. So I can click on add and I will be able to use one of these uh, licenses. So in principle, you can you can go back and you know choose a license that's useful for you. So I would really recommend go back and see the chooseyourlicense.com. But for the time uh, sake, I'm going to use Apache 2.0. And I'm going to see what it says. Apache allows commercial use, modification, distribution, patent use, blah, blah. It limits trademark use, liability, warranty. I'm going to just use that for the moment and say review and submit. So it allows me to open a file, which is license and scroll down. I don't have to read because conveniently some, some lawyers have done this already. I am because an owner of this project, I'm going to directly branch add the file in my main branch. But if uh, I was working with a lot of other people, I would not do that. So now I have a license. 
So if I go back to my insights and I go to my community, it will show me, okay, you're doing better. You've got two files which you needed, but it also tells me, okay, now you need to add a contribution guideline. You need to add a code of conduct and we've talked about it in the last call. So if you have these four files, you're very community ready. So people know how to contribute, how to use your file and what code of conduct do you use. The last thing that I'll show um, is the setting option. Setting has a lot. There are a lot of things that I don't even use. Um, but as you become a lot more advanced user of GitHub, you would probably start using the setting quite a lot where you'll show that we can have a manage access, which always asks you to add password, manage access by adding people, right? But it also, so where you can add um, sort of who is going to be your collaborator. But you can also, for example, limit their collaboration. I'm going to, for example, just show you, I'm going to add you. Y-O-C, I'm sorry. No, good. <laughs> Y-O-C-H-A, yeah. yep. Uh, there, I see you. I actually, I can invite to the repository. And I can, for example, once uh, she adds me, I can give her the access level. So I can allow her to become a direct contributor. I can like limit her from merging without my permission. So yeah, I'm going to just stop there but just want to say that what we have shown you is like the very basic usage. There's a lot to GitHub, a lot that I don't use, but a lot that, are, that comes with practice. So there, it is always a great idea to ask somebody who's been using GitHub if a feature you don't know exists or not, rather than spending hours in reading into the documentation. There's a lot of documentation that you don't want to read about. Um, just ask people in the Slack channel. I think that would be the best way to go forward. I have another question, if if I can. Uh, what happened if I want to uh, delete a fork from my list of repositories? Yeah, um, I'm going to just add a, quick, a link directly in the chat. And this is a chapter that someone from OLS2 had written about how to get started in GitHub. So what I'm gonna show you, and it's a danger zone, all right? In the sense that you don't do it all the time. Let's say I will show you, I hope I have a fork of some other per person's repository that I don't want to keep. So I have a lot of documents. Okay, I have a I have a repository that I don't want because I forked it from uh, an executive council. I made my changes and I don't want it anymore. I go in the setting and I completely scroll down to the bottom and I come to the danger zone and it says delete this repository. And it asks for double authentication, which is good because you know sometimes you don't want to delete and by mistake you clicked it. So it asked me, please type this. So I'm going to copy paste that. I understand the consequence of deleting this repository. So I click that and the repository is gone. So you can always delete the repository after you finish forking and pull it, making a pull request. So if I go back, I don't really have that anymore because I don't need it. So it, it, yeah, you can always delete the file that you don't need. Um, however, beware, once you delete on the GitHub, it is gone. Like if you by mistake deleted your own repository without any copy anywhere, it is gone completely. However, hey. let's say another thing is that if you have created a repository by forking someone else's repository and they decide to delete their repository, your version will be safe. So just okay. because someone else is deleting, it doesn't mean that your copy is being deleted. Okay, yeah. So same, okay. obviously this, the same happens. If I delete my fork, nothing will happen to the exactly. original. Exactly, okay. exactly, right. yeah. Okay. All right, folks, we are half an hour up and I'm so excited that you stayed around. There's a lot in GitHub that we are happy to show you, but try with these small ones. And once you feel that you, you're ready for more, ask us for more. We have a lot of resources that we can share with you. But definitely start with the material that we showed you today. There's a few things that we haven't covered in this workshop because it takes three hours to do them. 
but you should be able to do that. The basic thing would be that your repository can be used to uh, host these basic website that you can use. With that, I think we are ready to go. Thank you, Carla. And thank you everybody for sticking around. Thanks, Bernice. I did nothing. I mean, you do you do most of the